If you have your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. When Moses sent out the spies, I need those of you that aspire to the platform or leadership, I want you to hear this. When Moses sent out the spies, Joshua came back with a good report. Years later, when Joshua sent out spies, they returned with a good report. Pass the trial when you're not the leader, and you'll pass on the victory to those who follow you when you are the leader. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Let's just place our Bibles down. Let's lift, let's lift our hands to him. Let's talk to Jesus right now. Lord, we love you. We need you. God, we thank you for these lessons, Lord. I pray, God, that they penetrate the fertile soul of our souls so that every one of us is not easily shaken or removed uh, from the truth of the word of God. And we thank you for it. We praise you for it. And we do it all in the name of Jesus, uh, for there is no other name, God, in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. You can be seated. I, I, I know I sound like a broken le- record, but I kind of plan to continue to sound like a broken record because the greatest subject to study, to learn, to become an expert in is Jesus. There's no other subject that can bring peace. Mm-hmm. He brings peace. The scripture tells us in Philippians chapter 2, 10, 11, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess yes. that Jesus Christ is Lord. All right, isn't that, isn't that awesome? Amen. When the Bible is properly preached, the lost get evangelized, the saints get edified, and God is glorified. When the name of Jesus is preached, it establishes the house of the Lord. I'm going to give you just a couple more seconds to fix this sound because I'm not dealing this this bad up here, brother. It establishes the authority, and we need the authority of Jesus Christ by which we do everything for the Lord. That's why Paul said in Romans 1, 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power, everybody say power, Power. of God unto salvation. To everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also the Greek. You'll notice Paul in this verse and in our text, Paul doesn't refer to Jesus Christ. He refers to Christ Jesus. The reason I've been taught is that the syntax or order that these words are used is very important. Because when he first showed up, he was known as Jesus of Nazareth. But later he's called the Christ. Christ is the Greek word Christos, which means the anointed one. The only one that could be the anointed one is the Messiah. Jehovah would take on flesh and come bodily and physically to the earth. 1 Timothy 3.16 declares, and without controversy, great is the mystery of of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in the glory. So 
When you think of the other apostles who followed Jesus Christ, that was the order of their introduction. First of all, they knew him as Jesus of Nazareth. Then when he was resurrected, he was Jesus Christ. But you see, Paul was not one of the original followers. Paul's convert. Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. Paul said in, in, in Corinthians 15, he, he said, after that he was seen of James and all the, uh, the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. Understand when Paul meets Jesus, it's post-resurrection. He's already the Christ. He's already known as the Messiah. And those who were there in the beginning, he was Jesus Christ, but not to Paul. To Paul, he was Christ Jesus. And the order of that introduction is very important because contrary to popular opinion, the power is not found in the White House. The power is not found in the governor's house. The power is not found in the courthouse. The power is found in the Lord's house. There is no greater book than the Bible. No other book can take you from where sin has dragged you to where God wants you. The Bible is the living word. John 1 and 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In Romans 12 and 2, it says, be not conformed. This is, these are important words I want you to pay attention to. And be not conformed to this world. If everybody's doing it, there's... You're probably on the wrong road. He said, straight and narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. I, 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 don't, want, I don't want to go with the flow because only fish go with the flow. Dead fish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. These are two important, powerful words in Romans 12, conformed and transformed. In the original language, conformed is suskebatio. Yeah, I know you wanted to know that, but really it means to fashion oneself, to conform oneself, one's mind, one's character, to another's pattern. We're to pattern after Christ. Our character should be adjusted. Mm. In other words, I'm not going to conform to the world. I want to conform to Christ. To be conformed is to be something totally opposite of what Jesus has done for you. I got to change. He's saying, since you've got Jesus on the inside... Don't act like the world on the outside. Don't act or look like the devil. You know, hey, I'm, I'm a Christian in my heart. No, let, let's get real here. Can I help tell you about your heart? The Bible says it's desperately wicked. Who can know it? Don't give, me, don't give me that cockamamie idea about your heart. And all the old folks say, yeah, don't give me that mess. The next word, trans. Uh, is transformed. It's metamorpho. And you guys have been around here like the time have heard me even preach and teach on this. It's where we get the word metamorphosis. Wasn't too long ago I used this to explain the uh, what we see in the caterpillar to butterfly process because that's where this word uh, is used. It's when that worm-like creature that crawling around eating vegetation gets itself in that cocoon and in that cocoon metamorphosis takes place it's transformed from a green worm or into a butterfly that's brightly colored and can fly when it emerges it's different that's that's the new birth that's that's what it's talking about that's what it's supposed to look like when you're 
transformed. It means I'm altered. I'm, I've got a conversion and I'm changed. Uh, we're, we're doing some conversion, conversion on a car that I have. And we've cut some metal and done some stuff and added some things. And it's con con converting it. How many has been converted? I'm in the process of being converted. Mm. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Social programs are really powerless. A handout from the government will never do what a hand up from Jesus can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He created the world. You don't have to take my word for it. You can take his word for it. Paul uses the word in justified in, in Romans 5 and 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justified. He uses another word here in Romans 3, 25, whom God has set forth to be the propitiation through faith in his blood, his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Ever say propitiation. Justified, propitiation, or justification and propitiation. And in James 22 and 23, he says, imputed or imputation, he says, and the scripture was fulfilled which saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Justification is a change of our status. Propitiation is a change of our relationship, and imputation, that imputed, is a change of our accounts. Not guilty. I'm glad that he can impute himself into my life. You see, when you receive truth, when you, re when you receive truth, there's a change in your reality. When you receive mercy, there's a change in your heart. When you get... That faith, that, that change in where you place your trust and confidence in God. When you get joy and peace, that's where you get a change in your emotions. How many know you got you got anger? That's that's emotional problem. When you are you hear what I'm saying? Wait, so when you when you get faith, it'll change you and it'll get your confidence. When you get peace, it'll change your emotions. When when you get the love, it'll change your affections. Young men, young, young, young ladies, when you give the love of God and reciprocate that, you won't put your affections in the wrong place. You won't come walking in here, oops, he said he loved me. Mm -hmm. When you get remission, you get that change in your condition. You get that change in your sentence or conviction. When you get revelation, that's a change in your knowledge. When you get adopted, that's a change in your relations. When, when you get redemption, that's a change in your destination. When you get the resurrection, that's a change in your substance. Jesus declares that it's, that, that it's time that we've got to change our location. It's all about the metamorphosis. I've got to change what I am, a transformation. It's about being altered. It's about being modified. It's about saying, you know what? I, 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 it'd be easy to do this, but I'm going to alter. You act one way at school, you alter it when you walk at home. You're out on a Friday night when you shouldn't be. And you alter your conduct when you come in here on a Sunday morning. I know I'm not, I'm not talking about nobody around here. We're good. We're good around here. <laughs> it all points to that ultimate moment of the divine change that only Jesus can do. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51, 52 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 
It's talking about that 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 there, that is going to be another moment of change. But when you come in contact with Jesus, when you come in contact with His Word, when you start to learn and know of Him, this Jesusology things start to alter, things start to transform. Uh, I'll never forget, and I told this story before, but uh, there was a man in my home church that that got in trouble. He got in trouble for murder. He was in trouble for murder. He was going up for, for life, and, and, he, and you know, he kind of backslid out of church. Well, before he was going to go to prison, boy, he poured himself into the church. And he just transformed his life, and he changed it. Now, we still, when you go and sow a crop like that, you got to reap that harvest. He knew he was going to prison. But what happened was is the district attorney came to church. And the district prosecuting attorney saw him in the choir and met him and spent some time with him. And when he went to, to court, it, uh, he said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, your honor, God, so-and-so is this. And he called him a murderer. And he laid down and went through his name and everything he ever done. He said, but this is not the same man. There was a transformation that I've been con a conforming that that could happen, you know. You know, we have the only wise God. Be careful you don't trace God for an idol. When I was a kid, they were just, it was Battle of the Network stars, movie stars. Now they're idols. Really? We have the only wise God. The Bible says in Jude 125, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. You sit here, but understand, you are hearing the greatest message ever taught on the planet. The most important message. I know, I don't know where you sit emotionally, but we've tried to cover that. I don't know where you sit financially, but I'm telling you right here and right now, the most important thing isn't your finances. It isn't your emotions. It's your relationship with Jesus Christ. Listen what it says in Revelations. Revelation 3, 14 and 16. And under the angel of the church of Laodicea write, these things saith the amen, the faithful and true Witness, the beginning of cre the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou were cold or hot, which confuses us to a point. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I spew thee out of my mouth. Lukewarm people. They don't hate people, but they don't love people either. They're as indifferent as it gets. They can take church or they can leave church. That make sense? But church is not a members only club. Everybody's invited. Most of us would think that, and for years I thought, it's you gotta be hot. Hot is good, right? And cold was bad, but that's not what it says. He said to the church of Laodicea, I said, I'd rather you be hot or cold. Because if you're lukewarm, I don't want nothing to do with you. When you study the history of Laodicea and you realize what John's talking about, um, the, there, because the south of Laodicea, there were what they call hot springs or mineral springs. It was a popular place for people to go to, you know, get that relaxing moment and get rejuvenated. It was therapeutic for the body. And so um, they ran pipes. They actually made aqueducts and ran so they could pipe that water to the city. And north of Laodicea, there was mountains where there was snow and cool, crystal clear, clean water. And they ran aqueducts and clay pipes that direction too. Anybody ever looked in the bottom of your teapot after boiling water in it for a while and notice what happens? You get all that de mineral deposits in there. So what happened with these aqueducts that they ran, 
think the the hot one, as soon as the water started leaving, it started to cool or become lukewarm, and it dropped the sediment, the the mineral, and and it blocked it up. It stopped it up. Well, when the cold water was coming down, it went from cold to lukewarm. And by the time it got to the city, those, those, those clay aqueducts are there to this day. And even though they no longer work, they didn't have Joe and Delta Plumbing to call up and say, hey, come fix these pipes for us. And so over time, the flow of water stopped. So when, when, when John's speaking here to the church of Laodicea, they knew exactly what he was talking about when he made that statement because he, he said, I'd rather you were hot or cold because I don't want you to be lukewarm. What's really being said is, you've gotten so lazy, you just won't go to the source. You don't want to put out any effort. You want everything just to come to you. Your prayers just bless me, but don't use me. Oh, God, just give to me, but don't ask me to give. They, they be, that's lukewarm. We've got to get to Jesus. He's the source. It's the same with Jesus. We've got to go to the source. You just can't expect Jesus to keep coming to you again. And again and again. The Bible says, John 6 and 64, no one comes to God except he draws him. But when he draws you, Paul said, don't frustrate the grace of God. Don't take his presence and his love and his blessings for granted. Isn't that, you know, if you think about that's what Samson did, I'll rise at other times. No, you won't. You went too far. You got to learn to strike when the iron's hot. If God is moving, the Spirit's moving, you better come up to the altar. You may not have tomorrow. You may not have next week to get it right. You may not be here to get the Holy Ghost. You played around. You didn't take it serious. When God's dealing with you, you've got to move right then. When the water was stirred, they had to get put in. You got to get in the kingdom. You know, it's going to, the Bible, you know, as in the days of Noah, the Bible says, and we all look for those signs. Can I tell you the signs that we don't think about? Imagine what it sounded like, the signs sounded like to those that were inside after the door was shut and started raining. Where are those folks to say, to they, if they could come back, if they'd scream to us right now, get into church with all you got. Get in the church even if all they ever do is ask you to take out the trash. Get in the church if all they ever do is ask you to sweep the parking lot. Get in the church. Whatever you do, get in the church. Just be inside the church. Get in the body. Remember last week? Get in the body. Get in the church of the living God. Get, get in the ark of safety, the church. He's coming back for a church. This, this, this Jesus subject is so important. And it's sad today, but the Bible does tell us we'll be, all, be hated by all men for his name's sake. It's amazing that, that what can conjure up when you talk about Jesus' name and the importance of it. I, I, I posted something about it, and a friend I knew for 40-something years literally came unglued about it. It's the spirit of the age. Spirit of the age. They don't, they don't want to call on the... Name of Jesus, they don't want to baptize in the only saving name of Jesus. It says in John 20 and 31, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Through whose name? When you go to Leviticus, Leviticus 17 and 11 says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. You go to Hebrews 9 and 22, and it says, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. So according to Leviticus 17 and 11, life is in the blood, the power of the blood. What is the power of the blood? Life. They're synonymous. The Old Testament and the New, I, I said this to some of my brother Carl and I were talking about it. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, but the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. The Old Testament says life is in the blood. But when you get to the New Testament, it says life is in the name. 
So you put that all together, according to John 20 and 31, if you have the name, you have life. According to Levit Leviticus 17 11, if you have life, you have blood. So in Hebrews 9 and 22, if you have blood, you have remission. If you have remission, that's important. Remission is important. All of a sudden, God can forget. Another God's ca cast your sins as far as from east. God can forget your sins. God literally has the ability to forgive and forget. That's the power of the blood. That's the power of the life. That's the power of the name of Jesus. Because when you get Jesus, you get the blood. And when you get his blood, you get life. You can't separate them. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Only God can forgive and forget like that. So since it's the position biblically, then the opposite must be true. If you don't have the name, you don't have life. If you don't have life, you don't have the name. And you don't have blood, then there's no remission. If then there's no remission, then there's no change. You'll find in churches that don't preach this that there's no change. Like I stated last week in Acts 8, when they have beaten the disciples, in Acts 5, sorry, 5 and 28, they beat them. They got out and started preaching again. They grabbed them and said, did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, yeah, fill Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. You're going to bring this man's blood upon us? Isn't that exactly what we want to do? Because that's where the life is. We're going to preach in that name. That's where you get the life. That's because that's where you get the blood. Are you hearing me? That's the only way you can bring the blood on a city. That's the only way we can bring the blood on the life is we got to preach Jesus' name. Listen, Jesus died 2,000 years ago. And there's still only one legal liquid that can deal with sin, and that's the blood of Jesus. If you died 2,000 years ago, how are you going to access something that happened 2,000 years ago? You're going to go try to rehydrate the blood? That's why you have to understand the blood is in the name. When you have the name, you got the blood. When you get his blood, you get the life. Oh, I don't know if I may. I, uh, when you say Jesus, there is a power that is not found in any other name. That's why Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven. And that's everywhere. Given among men, whereby we must be saved. When you go to church, when you attend church, you've got to hear. You need to hear about the cross. You need to hear about the blood. You need to hear about the name because the cross is the heart of the gospel. But the blood is the life of the gospel. And the name is the power of the gospel. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The only thing that can save sinners, edify saints, and stop the enemy of sin is the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're going to preach right, if you're going to teach right, you need J-E-S-U-S. -S. That being said, if you're going to preach right and you're going to teach right, you're going to need another Jesus, the G-E-S-I-S. -S. It requires the right G-E-S-I-S, -S, Jesus. There are two G-E-S-I-S's. Exegesis is the critical explanation or interpretation of this text, especially scripture. In other words, it is the correct interpretation of scripture. That's exegesis. It is what the Bible intends for it to say. But eisegesis, which is E-I-S-E-G-E-S-I-S, -E -E -S -S, is an interpretive version. 
of the Bible by reading your own interpretation into it. In fact, one of the definitions that I read is it's, a, it's considered a poor exegesis of the text. The right, J-E-S-U-S, demands the right, G-E-S-I-S. That's right. That's right. That's right. The correct exegesis demands we use the correct hermeneutical exegesis. Glad y'all looking at me, you college kids over here. Let all these crazy hermeneutical exegesis. Listen, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to connect it for you. You're doing better than you think. Just keep listening. Listen, you have to understand we're talking about Rome. We're talking about Greece. In ancient Greek religion and mythology, there were 12 Olympians, the major deities of the Greek pantheon commonly considered to be Zeus, Hera, Poseidon, Demeter, Athena, Apollo, Artemis, Ares, and whatever his name is, Hepatesis, whatever it is, Aphrodite, Hermes, I'll get to him in a minute, and, and either Hestia or Dionysus. They used these fictitious created mythical characters to explain the things in their lives. They didn't have J-E-S-U-S, -S, okay? One of these 12 that I mentioned is Hermes. Hermes is the son of Zeus, who's the big boss. He's the big guy. Hermes was said to be very swift and a very fast messenger, whose job was to interpret because he was the only one who could understand Zeus's words. So Hermes is the basis for where we get the word hermeneutics. If you come into the office over there, in fact, I showed it to someone the other day, I've got a book called Biblical Hermeneutics. It is a study of hermeneutics of the Bible. It's in over there now. It's got no pictures in it. You're not going to like it if you're looking for it. It's a study book, all right? Now, hermeneutics is the science of interpreting the Bible. Are you hearing me? And historically, the Roman equivalent to Hermes was Mercury. If you turn to Acts 4 and 12, I'll make the connection for you here. The Roman equivalent to Hermes was Mercury. And that's why the Bible says in Acts 4 and 12, and they called Barnabas Jupiter. And Paul Mercurius, or Mercury, because he was the chief speaker. The Amplified Bible says it this way, they began calling Barnabas Zeus chief of the Greek gods, and Paul Hermes, messenger of the Greek gods, since he took the lead in speaking. Hermes is the god of speech. So when you talk about hermeneutics, you're talking about correctly interpreting scripture. The Bible says rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Understand, when you get behind this pulpit, you're not to be do, doing any eisegesis. Hello? If you're going to get behind here, you better study to show yourself approved and exegete the text. Because there's only one Jesus that we're going to preach here, and that's J-E-S-U-S. And if you're going to get J-E-S-U-S, you better get the G-E-I-S-I-S correct. Are you with me? Listen, if you can rightly divide it, and you can wrongly divide it or interpret it. Homiletics <laughs> is another word you hear around church. It's just another word. Homiletics is to speak in a way that is natural to your disposition. Now, we've got some wonderful speakers around here, and we all have different characters or personalities. One of the greatest examples to explain homiletics is, is the burning bush that Moses experienced. The bush was on fire, but was not consumed. It was on fire, but it didn't change into burnt embers. It was still a bush that kept burning. And like preachers, we're preaching or we're teaching, the word is coming forth, but we still retain our personality. We will still retain our character. We're still who we are. Like the bush, we're not consumed, but the word comes forth because we're 
exegeting the text properly with biblical hermeneutics, correct? Amen. Why'd I say all that? It matters who you're listening to. And I see some of you. You share and post some of these and they're teaching. Yeah, it sounds good. They, they're, they're, they're teaching on a subject. I get it, but understand. Weak messengers with weak sermons produce weak Christians. Strong preaching produces strong converts. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying? Hebrews 5.14, but strong meat belongs to them that are full age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. If you can't discern both good and evil, it's time to hit the church gym. Some of y'all need a page out of Sister Carol's book about being faithful and get you working at the church so you know what you're doing here. There's a rule in preaching. You can't take a subject that's not contained in the text. In other words, don't put your own spin or ideas on it. Because if you do, that's... There's a word. What's the word? That's the, the wrong Jesus. Which one? Uh-uh. I said Jesus. You're going to get this. Because tonight we're talking about exegesis. Yes. Hermeneutical exegesis. We're talking about Jesus, exactly how it's meant to be preached and taught. Right? Not I said Jesus, where... You're making the text say what you want it to say. Because we have folks on every corner. We got sermonettes that create Christianettes. False teaching makes fake Christianity. If you have a propensity, if you grew up broke, you're going to preach a prosperity gospel. If you're a talented woman and you grew up in a male-dominated culture, you might be prone to teach a feminist gospel. They're out there. If you grew up dealing with racism, you might preach a race-based gospel. I preached all over. I've seen a lot of stuff. The basis of the gospel, the only important point of the gospel, is Jesus. It's not any of those other personal ideologies. It's not finances. Because if, if, you, if you preach Jesus, you won't get your finances right. But if you get your finances right, don't mean you get Jesus. Now, I know, I know we got a problem in this country about race. I'm going to tell you something. You can preach all about race, but that don't mean you get Jesus. But if you get Jesus, you're going to realize we're all one blood. Uh huh. You know, I'll tell you. I know we 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 we've we've proven fact that women women have been held down in this world. I I I will not argue that point. I get it. I see it. But if you can get feminism straight now, doesn't mean you get Jesus. Any of those gospels won't save anybody, but only a Jesus gospel will. The prosperity gospel ain't gonna save anyone. You'd be the richest people in the graveyard in hell. However you want to so understand, I said Jesus is making it say what you want. Exit Jesus is what it really means. And that's what we want. So I want to bring this to a close. I'm going to read to you some of the verses that are at the end before of the Gospels. Luke 24, 47 says that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Mark 16 and 15 says, and he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Matthew said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Luke said it should be preached throughout the world in his name. Mark said it should be preached to every creature. Matthew said teach all nations. They all agree. They were all sent by Jesus. They all agree and said the same thing. Not exactly identical, but what they said was the same thing. 
Now, you'd have a contradiction if Matthew and Mark reverse what they said. But they don't contradict. These verses or these, these portions of Scripture are known as the Great Commission. Go to the world. So I'm going to ask you two questions of which both the answers are no. It's even better than multiple choice. I love multiple choice. It's the only way I had a chance. Is the final saving name the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? And my second question is, does Matthew 28, 19 refer to three persons? No and no. You see, if Jesus is not the final saving name, then someone should have told Paul. Because he said in Philippians, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Jesus said, All power was given to me. If Jesus was telling the and in Matthew 20, 19, to baptize in the titles, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Then why did none of them obey him? Were, were they all disobedient? There's not one place in the entire New Testament where someone was baptized that way. So was everybody in the New Testament wrong? Listen to Luke. Luke 24 and 45. Then he opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Listen, he opened their understanding that he might, that they might understand the scriptures. What did he do? He made sure they understood. And he said to them, thus is written, thus it behooves Christ to suffer and raise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. So did they all misunderstand him after he opened their understanding? Because Peter says in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts 8 and 16 says, For as not yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Acts 10 and 48, And he commanded, commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Acts 19, And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Jesus. In fact, these guys were rebaptized. Acts 22 and 16. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away the sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Let's stand. 1 Corinthians tells us in verses 13, 15 of chapter 1, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Lest any should say that I baptized in my own name. Brother Joe, I believe they understood it perfectly. I believe they understood it. And they did exactly what they should when he opened their understanding. Listen, there are innocent misunderstandings. There are. Some folks think, in fact, anybody got an iPad in the room? If you show it up or iPhone, there's a symbol on there. What is that symbol? Some folks think Adam and Eve ate an apple. That's the whole pretense behind Apple using that. They were taking the bite. Sometimes you don't realize some of the things you, well, I, I got one right here. Relax, Carla, we're good. The Bible just said it was fruit. Was it an apple? Look, I don't think that's a heaven or hell issue. If it was me, I'd have bypassed the apple. I wouldn't try to find a nectarine or something. Give me an orange, I don't want that apple. 
This is not a heaven and hell issue, but Jesus is. The name of Jesus is. You better get it right. Matthew wrote to the Jews and introduced Jesus as the lion, the king. Mark wrote to the Romans and presents Jesus as a servant. Luke wrote to the Greeks and presented Jesus as a man. And John wrote to the world presenting Christ as God in the flesh. Matthew told you what Jesus taught. Mark told you what Jesus wrought. Luke told you what Jesus brought. And John taught you what Jesus thought. But none of them, none of them told you how to be born again. I got one that heard what I said. It's important that you go to the right places in the Bible for what you're actually looking for. Matthew taught you that Jesus was the Messiah, the promised Savior. Mark said he was a powerful Savior. Luke said he was a personal Savior. John said he was God, our Savior. But you have to turn the page to the next book, the book of Acts, to find out and to get Jesus as your Savior. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's all in that name. Say Jesus. Jesus. That's the name. Jesus. Everybody praise the Lord. I had one right there. Oh, I got one. one uh, someone who where, he's in the back. He said, "Hallelujah." For years, I was taught and told that Hallelujah is the highest praise you can give God. But you have to understand. Hallelujah. Yah is a conjunction of Jehovah. Halle is to praise. So when I ask you to praise the Lord, those of you who said hallelujah, just repeat it back to me what I said to you. I'm not going to baptize anybody saying hallelujah. Ain't no one going to be healed by me saying hallelujah, bro. But if I say Jesus... But if you get Jesus, uh, and if you call on the name of Jesus, get baptized in the name of Jesus, believe in the name of Jesus, trust in the name, you get everything. 